So here is my press after it's all said and done. I've got three three eighths inch bolts on every each corner with two placement screws when I started out just to hold it in place for me to bolt them. And that's the, the edges. I actually just had the one 3 8 bolt in here and, and used the press once and it started moving it, moving these boards out of, sec, out of sync. So that's, today is gonna be the second use of this press. I'm gonna see if these 3 8 bolts actually do what I, what I hope they'll do. They're, they're two by, I believe, two by tens. So I figured just one vertical beam and two horizontal beams were strong enough to hold the press. And essentially they are hold, strong enough to hold the press. However, uh, they're gonna be even more supported now. And what I've used for the actual press portion is a car jack that I just had in an extra just an extra car jack. And what I did to mount it was, I took this block, this two by 10, that was extra from everything else that I cut. And I drilled seated sections in here to put a small 3 8 bolt in there on either side, because it was just a little bit, if I was gonna keep it center, it's just a little bit too far from here so that it wouldn't damage this if I tried to screw it in there. So rather than, damage anything. I just bolted this uh, jack onto this block of wood and then screwed the block of wood into this the frame itself. It's got about 18 inches of clearance inside the opening here. 18 inches vertically and that's enough to supply several layers of, of pressing compounds. And I also have these 1x3s um, mounted to the, the base. Each of them are about 20 inches long and uh, only about half of them are actually bolted down. <clears throat> and these are taken out in, uh, in the event that I have just a, a regular screen or something like that that I want to press right through. But they're fine if they're unbolted as long as these other Every other one is bolted like that. All right, so here I have a metal tray. Uh, and before I press anything through this, I'm gonna wanna wash it. But what I've done is I've, I bought it, it was just wide enough to fit in here. And as the underside of these boards go, this one's cut out just enough to where that guy will be able to drain straight through and not get all over the place here. And it actually does drain straight down pretty pretty well instead of splattering all over the place. That sits there at the base. And then I've taken a plastic Coca-Cola container, like a, a carrier, a carrying case, and I've several of those, four of those, and I've cut the screens out of the bottom of them. And these screens will go underneath the first set of fabric and we'll set this fabric on here, we'll set the, the, the mash in here, and then I'll set another screen on top, and then I'll set another mash in here, and then the third screen, and then this block will separate what's being pressed from the actual jack. As it pushes it down, squeeze all that juice out, it'll drain from here, and it'll fall into this long bin that I've got. Now that'll sit on the ground. So as the juice gets, as the juice squeezes from this area here, this is going to sit underneath of it. And we can actually lean the machine forward, lean the, the press forward. All of this stuff is going to be pressed down. So it's not going to go anywhere. And the benefit to leaning it forward like this is that all that juice in the back that just kind of sits behind with the fabric will will force all the, all the other juice underneath it to flow forward. And as this comes forward and back, the stream also comes forward and back, so you can't just set a bucket down there, because uh, it'll, it'll push on the bucket and move it. And if that spills, obviously you're gonna have a problem. So this is nice and low to the ground. It's got splash boards on either side. You can put it this way, or you can turn it parallel to the, the press. 
I'm also going to put an O-ring here so that it can attach to a chain and you can just leave it in the leaned forward position and let it sit there and drain out for half an hour to an hour uh, without anybody attending, attending to it. Looks like the edges go just underneath here, which means if something comes by and bump, bumps it during the process, it won't go anywhere. Another little, little added notion of security there. Now normally you'd want to put blocks behind on either side so when it's leaning forward and it's weighted on the string here, it won't slide that way. And I can uh, put a, a brick behind there. Okay, so these first set of apples uh, that I've got, I've got two full five-gallon buckets full of those apples. Those are just wild apples. I picked those right on the campus where I work. The other set of apples are a mixture of Cortland and Macintosh apples. And th these one, two, three, four bags that are right here next to the green bins are apples that we're going to have waiting for the next two weeks. They're just going to sit there. The other ones that we've got are basically another full set of, we'll call it a total of 20 gallons worth of apples here and the same count in the, in the blue bins. And the big apples, uh, these have been sitting for uh, two weeks. They actually crush under a little bit. As you can hear, that is perfect. They're stiff, but when, when, when you press hard, there's a little break. You want to get your apples uh, from wherever you get them and let them sit long enough to where they do that. That means that the pectins inside have broken down the sugars enough that it's a nice, it'll be a nice yield for, uh, for the, the yeasts to start eating up. So the large ones are Cortland's, and these small ones here are, are called Macintoshes. And the, you, you kind of want to look for the redder of all, all of the apples. Some of them, I, you know, when you get there, they're either picked through or they're not. But in either case, you try to get the reddest ones possible for that nice, rich sort of red color uh, for the cider. For this pressing, I'm actually going to make 10 gallons of cider out, out of two five-gallon buckets. These need to be commercial food grade buckets to, to maintain cleanliness and obviously you never want to buy used buckets. Um, and we're going to fit them with the lids that need to have that rubber seal on there. And I'm going to put a one-way airflow in here or what's called an, an air stop uh, by drilling in a, a circle into here and then putting the, the, the air stop in there. Uh, we're going to take the apples and to make the pumice out of it, we're going to just use a residential grade food processor, just dump them into there, and then um, scrape what we get out of the processor into the buckets, and then the and then from there we just press it in the, in the press. There are three ways that you can mix your ciders, and the book that I'm reading on cider making states that it's uh, for the better yields it's good to have a mixture of, of flavors uh, the three different ways that you can mix them is as you're uh, processing them in the food processor you can mix them all together and just have the juice come out any way any way it is uh, that particular way you don't have any control over the percentage of what apples uh, one-third of this and half of that or whatever uh, the other the second way to do it is to press them separately and then mix the juices together so you do have uh, a more accurate 
you know, way of mixing, okay, if I only want two parts Macintosh, one part, you know, normal red American apples, or the third way, which is the most, which is the way that the cider maker has the most control, is to press them each separately, to ferment them each separately, and mix them after they've fermented, uh, just to perfect the right, the right taste or whatever. Uh, not really sure how I'm going to do that just yet, but I'll probably do that by way of taste. I'll probably uh, food process them all separately and then mix the juices in, in a cup and just see what ones I like the best and probably just do it that way. So basically the process here is to just take the, the apples, process them in a residential grade food processor, put them in the commercial uh, grade, uh, food grade five gallon buckets, then we're going to put the airlock on the lid and the lid with the nice rubber seal is going to lock down onto that and it's basically just going to sit in my garden room and provide CO2 for the plants for the next three to four weeks. Cider doesn't really take that long so three to four weeks of fermenting will start kicking that CO2 into the into the air. I'll have these going for about two weeks and then I'll make the other batch of apples which are going to take about two weeks to sit until they have that nice hard punch on the outside of the skin. And that's it. All right, so here we have our apples that are about to be cut. And you can take your core and you can put it in your little compost bag. Apples make really, really great uh, fuel for compost. All right, so what do you want to do when you've got your apples uh, is to, you don't have to thoroughly inspect each one, but looking on the outside, seeing stuff like this, it looks like it's just a sort of a surface blemish. You can cut that out and if there's nothing down below it, you can tell that a worm hasn't gotten in there or something like that, that's fine. And then you just core it. So each one it needs to be cored and you generally don't want to use the core itself. And if they're, if they're soft enough, what you what you have is a really easily coreable apple. It really just slides right through there and you've got your core there. Generally you don't need to use the core. You'll have plenty of uh, juice that comes out of these guys. Looks like it's turning it into soup but even then it'll still be okay and once that's good we'll pop this guy off we'll take all of this mesh here this is called the pumice this is ex oh, this is almost liquefied this is like a lot more dent they're a lot more liquidy than and what I normally get when I process them in different ways. So I think we might try a different blade next time, but we're still going to keep that. That's going to be good. So we're going to take the pumice. And we're going to kind of just dump it right into the five gallon bucket from here. Making sure we get all that good stuff in there. All right, so this is actually <clears throat> more along the lines of what I'm looking for. There are lots of little shredded pieces in here. That's going to be really, really good for our pumice, for putting that through the press. That's going to really uh, extract a lot of the, the juice out of there. Perfect. Dump it. The, uh, the, st the stuff on top is definitely more... Uh, white, it's got more of the, the pith, and the stuff on the bottom is uh, has got a lot of the... It's been oxidated while it's been sitting there, so it's oxidized a little bit. However, it's just got a little more of the rind, a little more of the peel in there, so that looks a lot better. Okay, so at this point, I'm ready to press the pumice into juice, and the juice is going to be collected down here, as I've said. Uh, but in preparation for this, I've, I've done two things. Based on the last time that I, I did this, I've added these inserts here that will add stability to the metal tray. 
And the reason that I'm adding them this time, and didn't do it last time, is because, as you can see, it probably it bent into it when I did not have those extra pieces there. There's, a, there's another, there's another benefit, and that's that it's lighter and it'll, it'll carry a little easier without those extra planks, but that may not make that much of a difference. In any case, I've made sure that all of my instruments are clean. I just washed this out. It's nice and clean. Uh, another thing that I learned from the last time is that I need a towel handy. And that's more or less just to, to put it down below and beside this because eventually you're just going to make a spill. It's, it's, as tidy and neat as you make the process and as prepared as you can possibly be for it, you're still going to spill some things. Another thing is to get one of these, a little hand towel. Well, hand towel just kind of wipes stuff that it spills on. If you do that quick enough, the point of, of keeping it clean, it's, it's obviously uh, good to keep it sanitary, but probably the, the best, most important thing is that you keep flies out. And the flies that, like the, the fruit flies and things that smell that stuff will come in the, the quickest of all of the flies. So keeping that in mind, uh, that's kind of uh, going to be what you want to do. So uh, without further ado, let's start doing this. So I'm put my first rack down and I'm going to put my towel down here. I had uh, two 30 gallon green Sterilite uh, bins up about halfway with apples and that yielded two jugs, uh, two five gallon jugs of pumice. It's actually uh, one and a half or so jugs of a five gallon uh, pumice. I'll put that in and, and press it now. All right, so to get it out, you're gonna need a big, uh, I prefer like a stainless steel um, ladle. That's not the, the, the soup kind, but like the spoonish kind. It helps with the angle. It's hard to get the, the, the deep spoon in there and get that angle. This one does really well. And as I grind it up, I keep the lid on it, which keeps the flies out, and it also keeps that sort of rusty coloration uh, from setting in too early. And that'll really start affecting the, the taste, I think, of the, the cider. So I've got two of these fabrics. It's just a sheet. It's all it is is a, a white sheet that I've used uh, in the past to do this, and so it's got that, that sort of color on it. You just lay this in here, and you you got to be careful that this doesn't touch the ground. So you kind of fold it up as, it, as you lie it in there. And I've also found that this works as a, a sort of something to like stack the, the apple pumice into it. As long as it's clean, it'll, it'll keep sturdy. And it'll also help you keep the sheet spread out and pulled as it should be and sort of be able to allow you to be able to fold this over so that it doesn't hit the ground. And you don't want to touch the fabric to the jack because the jack has car grease on it basically from previous use. If at all possible get a new jack or whatever you're going to use to press it with and even if it's new it's still going to have that grease on it so keep it separate from the, the juice at all costs. All right, so I'm going to start loading the pumice.
<clears throat> before I've even ended my, my first stacking of, of the grinded materials, I can already see the juice has started to come out of here and into my bin. So the pressing process starts before you even press anything. All right, so I've finished putting one set of the uh, the grinds of the pumice that I'm going to put in there, and I've taken my my little bracket out of there. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do now is just basically pull it up as much as I can, get the tension as taut as possible against the outer edge of the pumice. and pull it up on either side. What I'm actually going to do later is fold this in half. Once this has been pressed much flatter than it is, I'm going to fold it in half and press it again. And that'll get all these outer edges here. And it's already really, really, really starting to, to drain. There's some good juice coming out of here. I'm going to set that guy right there. Alright, so another way you can do it is to put the support on the outside, the square support around the outside, and start filling it up with the fabric that I used as a liner on the inside. And what that'll do is give you a, another option for giving structure to the pile of pumice that you're going to make inside here and give it that uniformity as it starts pressing the pumice. Okay, so now I'm ready to begin the pressing process for my apples, so I'm gonna use this last screen here, and that'll go right here. And this time what I think I'm also gonna do is leave this outer, um, I don't even know what I'm calling it now. I'm gonna leave that surrounding bit there I'm going to use this block to drop right between the jack and the press so there's no direct contact. And I actually used it on a certain side last time. And, and it's got the, the oil, the grease from that. So I'm going to keep that away from the, the cider. And I also have this tool here. It's a, I think it's a half inch bolt on a ratchet. So it's just gonna it's gonna press the jack from the back side. And one of the things I noticed from last time is that I really have to watch down the back of this tray because it, it likes to it likes to fill up in the back and leak through, which is another reason that I made the design. Uh, to lean forward and keep that pressed material from leaking too much out the back before it goes out the front.
So basically I'm going to push that um, a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to crank it and it'll go down. I'm going to crank it. It'll go down. Uh, I'm going to, but I'm going to do that in sections, like over time. I'm going to let it sit for five minutes and then I'm going to do it again. It'll overwhelm the sides and spill off the sides if I don't do that. And so <clears throat> all along the side here, you can see all this splashing has come up. So it's good that I got this bin to save from all that waste on either side of there. That's neat. And what I did here to allow the, the nozzle, the hole here to have an opening, I put two shot glasses in between the fabric and the tray, just so it'll give that, it'll, it'll keep the fabric from stopping up that hole. When it's all said and done, when I'm, when I'm pushing down, I'm cranking down on my final little squeezes, then I'm going to let it set for about an hour and then it'll kick all the rest of that stuff out of there. Then I'll fold them in half and do it again. And that'll be it.